Good morning, Camelback Bible Church. It is good to be with you all. I was reading in Psalm 77 this morning, and the psalm starts off just with great troubles. And then the psalmist takes his eyes off the troubles and uh, looks to the Lord and who he is and what he's done. And uh, his, his uh, whole outlook changes. And uh, that's what we have an opportunity to do this morning. Take our eyes off the turbulence of our world, perhaps of our personal lives, and place them on our God who is our one stability, our one security uh, on, on, on the face of Jesus Christ. So that's what we're going to try to do this morning. As we begin, we want to take a moment and greet our guest. If you're uh, with us for the first time, we want to say how glad you, uh, we are that God has brought you to us or brought, uh, yes, you to us this morning, and uh, we would love to get to know you, and the way we do that is we ask you to take out your phone and text Welcome CBC to 94000. Uh, that's Welcome CBC to 94000. Uh, that'll connect you with our guest card. If you give us a little information about yourself, uh, we promise just to keep you informed with what's going on in our church family. And then please join us on June the 6th. Uh, that's two Sundays from now at the 9 o'clock hour. Uh, we have what we call Discovery One. It's a one-week introduction to our church. Uh, give you an opportunity to have some of your questions answered. Uh, you need to sign up for that. The best way to do that is to do that on the Church Center app. If you need help with any of that, please, after service, just go to the welcome desk, and they'll help you to, uh, do the sign-up and get on that, uh, on that guest uh, registration there. A few things we want to bring to your attention. We want to encourage you to come back today at uh, 4 o'clock for our annual meeting. Uh, it's an important time for our church family as we get together and we look at our vision, uh, we look at our budget, we also look at some new elders who will be uh, joining the elder team. Uh, this is an important way for members to live out their membership covenant, so we want to encourage you to come and join us at 4 o'clock in the Family Life Center. This Wednesday, our women's uh, study on Romans 8 is going to be beginning. Um, there'll be opportunities both in person as well as uh, on Zoom. Important that you sign up by no later than Wednesday. Uh, I can't think of a more encouraging chapter in Scripture than Romans 8, so we encourage you to take advantage of that encouraging study together. Vacation Bible Camp is just two weeks away, um, and we have over 200 children signed up. Uh, and as uh, it's a problem that I have that I want to let more children come in. Um, and so, but in order to do that, I need about four or five other uh, workers to be uh, in the classroom to, uh, you know, uh, uh, work with the kids around a table. We also need some help in the, in the, um, uh, in the I was going to say cafeteria, um, in the, uh, in the kitchen, there you go. Words aren't coming to me this morning, so sorry. Um, so if you've been thinking about it, uh, yes, there is a need. We'd love to get four or five more. Then I, I would be able to add some more children to the list. And uh, we're looking forward to two weeks uh, from today. Um, uh, we'll be working furiously. Finally, our youth, you have your first swim and study this Wednesday at 6 o'clock at the Perkins. A uh, great opportunity to grow in community as well as to grow in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the choir is ready to uh, point us and call us to the praise of Jesus. Let's uh, give attention to their musical offering.
invite you to stand now and join me for our call to worship taken from Psalm chapter 67. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let's sing together hymn 16, Sing Unto the Lord.
let's now affirm together with Christians throughout the ages the core truths of our faith. Let's do that together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Listen to these words from Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love towards us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we are here this morning to praise you. Praise your greatness, your faithfulness, your goodness. Um, you created this world. You have placed us in it to be. We've, made, we've been made in your image. You've called all the nations of the earth to you, Lord. Your faithfulness is to all people. All people deserve to praise you, Lord, because you are a good and majestic and gracious God. And, and that is what we are here to worship and to praise and to proclaim this morning. And so we do so in the stillness of our hearts this morning. And yet, Lord, we also want to remember that not all people have recognized you for who you are. We have rejected your love and your grace. We have gone our own way. We worship ourselves. Uh, we seek for purpose and meaning outside of your plan and your sovereignty. And we confess that. And so let's listen to this choral reflection um, and let's reflect on that individually.
but our God is rich in mercy. So let's listen to these words of hope from John 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is God's promise. continue on in prayer. Lord, this morning, this Sunday morning, we picture a wave of praise circling the globe and raising songs to heaven. Starting in East Asia and then swelling across the Middle East and Africa racing across the Americas, crashing into the Pacific, Lord, we picture this wave. House churches and mega churches, thatched roofs, cathedrals, every major language singing to you. Different passports, but one home country. And yet, even all this is not enough. The psalmist cries for all the world to praise you, and yet you are greater still. So we pray today that you will make your name great and glorious in this world. Keep going. We pray, Lord, that people from every tribe and tongue, and language, and nation will look to you and see your greatness and glory in Jesus Christ and find hope and restoration. We pray that you would save sinners and transform lives and make wars to cease. Ultimately, Lord, 
we pray what your people have prayed across the centuries. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. We want you, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of your government, there will be no end. And we can't wait to see that fulfilled. Lord, with that in mind, we pray that you would work in our hearts and give us hearts that reach out to the world with the gospel. Lord, as a sending church, we pray that we would be faithful in joining hands with the missionaries that have gone out from our body. We pray today, Lord, particularly for Clayton and Ellie Oliveira in Brazil and Kent and Susie Richardson reaching international students in Boston with crew. What a strategic ministry. Lord, we pray for our local ministries as well. We think of Hope Women's Center as Tammy Abernathy gives leadership to that. We think of the Creighton Community Foundation reaching out with physical and spiritual, to meet physical and spiritual needs to our neighbors and for the Osborne Convalescence Center. Lord, we pray that the gospel would go out in our community and we pray that the gospel would go out in our neighborhoods. Open our eyes to see our neighbors as eternal souls, men and women, created in your image, created to know you and to love you and give us opportunities to talk about Jesus with them. We pray, Lord, for a church family. You've placed us here to extend the love of Christ together. And so we pray that you will knit our hearts in relationships, community that is compelling and attractive to the world around us. We pray, Lord, for vacation Bible camp coming up and for the children that are already signed up and those who still want to come, we pray that leaders will step forward, a few more additional leaders so we can bring in more kids to hear about Jesus. We pray for Pastor Ron and his team as they're working hard to get ready for that. Lord, we pray for physical needs in our body. Particularly, we think of Naomi and Daria and Jim, and Ronell, Kathleen, and Linda. Ask for your healing. We pray for expectant moms in our congregation, for safe deliveries, healthy children. Pray for those who are grieving, particularly Mardette and Bob Schill's family. Ask for grace and comfort and hope for them. Lord, we pray all these things with confidence, bringing to you the things that are on our hearts this morning. Because you are our king, and we honor you by bringing our needs to you. And we lift up to you the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, this is, I uh, wanted to let you know one thing. This is going to be a big week for the Lusted household. Uh, on Tuesday morning at 7.30, I think it is, Jen is scheduled for her C-section. And so next Sunday, Pastor Luke is going to be Daddy Luke. So you can be praying for uh, their family as they welcome, get ready to welcome little Nathaniel. Um, we're at the point where we're ready to begin uh, collecting our offering and gathering our tithes and offerings.
uh, in the service, which we haven't done for a, a year. Uh, but not all of our ushers are back, and so we need uh, a few people, men or women, to step forward as ushers and help to collect uh, the offerings on Sunday morning. So if you're able to help with that, there's a sign-up sheet um, in the back at the information table. You can just jot your name down or talk to me or Pastor Luke. He's got other things on his mind. Talk to me, and uh, we'll, uh, we'd, we'd love to have you help uh, with, with that part of the, of the morning. Well, as we get ready to hear this offertory, let's remember what it says in Psalm uh, 50 that the Lord says, the beasts of the, every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. It is all his. Everything that we have is his. And so we're offering back to him ourselves, our time, our talent, our treasures for his glory. Our scripture this morning is Psalm 98. If you'd like to follow along, you can find it in the, uh, excuse me, in the uh, Bible in the pew rack in front of you. It's on page 500. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre and the lyre and the sound of melody. 
with trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the king, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Thank you, Mary Gail. Keep your Bibles open to Psalm 98, this great psalm that we have to look at today. Well, when Lisa and I were first married, you know, you have all these adjustments for your first year of marriage. <laughs> and uh, one morning, I was in the bathroom getting ready for the day. And like I had done for years, I was singing in the shower. That was just kind of my deal. And uh, she came in and said, very kindly, Jim, I, I know you're praising God, but you have a loud voice, and I'm still waking up. Would you mind keeping it down? <laughs> and I was like, oh. And she was so kind, but I had a lot to learn. The writer of Proverbs captures exactly what she was saying. Proverbs 27, 14. Whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice rising early in the morning will be counted as cursing. That's true. And there's wisdom in the book of Ecclesiastes. For everything there is a season. A time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, and we could add a time for quiet and a time for singing in the shower. And I mention this because Psalm 98 is a loud psalm. Some psalms are quiet and introspective. Some deal with sin and defeat and despair or loneliness, but this this is a celebration. It's more like a football game than a library, more like a rock concert than a recital. The psalmist is using his outdoor voice, and he even calls on all creation to roar with praise. This is such a great psalm of worship. We have a number of hymns that are written based on this psalm. We sang one of them this morning. Did you catch that? We were actually singing through this entire psalm in the first hymn that we sang this morning. But the best known psalm that's, song that's based on this psalm is Joy to the World by Isaac Watts, one of our favorite Christmas carols. And just like this psalm, it's joyful and energetic. So what's all the excitement about? Why this loud celebration? To walk through this psalm, we'll see the call to worship in verses 1 through 3, and then the sound of worship in verses 4 through 6, and then the scope of worship in verses 7 through 9. If you wanted to make it all three S's, you could say the summons, the sound, and the scope of worship. And that'll help us walk through this psalm. So, this loud, excited psalm, the call to worship, the reason for all this loud singing is God's salvation. You can see that word salvation repeated in each of the first three verses. His right hand works salvation. The Lord has made known his salvation. All the ends of the earth has seen the salvation of our God. Now this word salvation could be translated victory or deliverance. There's no specific victory from Israel's past mentioned here. And Psalm 98 is looking forward as we look at the context to a victory in the future that will bring joy and blessing not just to Israel but to the world. So Psalm 98 is looking forward to God's victory, his salvation in Jesus Christ. 
And the psalmist is so sure of this, he can see it so clearly that it opens in the past tense. God has done this. Prophetic certainty. It's as good as here. A new salvation calls for a new song. A song for the whole world to sing. So what's this salvation like? What's fueling this celebration? Well, first of all, salvation is God's work. Notice verse 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand, his holy arm have worked salvation for him. Salvation is God's work. God did miracles and, quote, marvelous things when he brought Israel up from Egypt in the Exodus. You remember the plagues and parting the Red Sea and providing manna and guiding them with the cloud and the fire. But now God has done marvelous, miraculous things again. A new exodus. And the salvation that God has accomplished in Christ is this great marvelous thing, and it is his work from beginning to end. Think about how this is God's work. It's his initiative. Before the beginning of time, God planned and purposed to send his son into the world. Do you realize that before God created the world, he knew that we would sin and rebel against him, and even at that moment, he decided that he would send his son into this world as our savior to suffer and die in our place before he created us. Now, you and I might say, well, forget that. I'm not going to create them then if I know what they're going to do. No, not God. Salvation was his initiative. And when Jesus came into this world, he lived with the power of God among us. Jesus said, I have shown you many good works from the Father. That's where his life came from. That's where his power came from. Jesus' death on the cross was God's plan, and Jesus' resurrection was God's plan, his work to vindicate his Son. And Paul prays that Christians will see God's great power in Jesus' resurrection, his work. Here's what we read in Ephesians 1. He prays that you may know the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. God's work in our salvation. His marvelous work. And your response to the gospel is his work too. You thought it was your idea. He was thinking of it before you were. Jesus said, John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. If you're a Christian, the reason you came to Christ is because God drew you. You were dead, he made you alive. You were blind, he opened your eyes. That was his work. Now this really matters because you cannot praise God if you think salvation is your work. Unless you see that it's his work, you won't be able to celebrate with the volume and energy this psalm requires. It's his marvelous work. The more you think you've done your, in your own salvation, the less you're going to praise God. Martin Luther saw this clearly. Here's what he said. But when the works and power of God are unknown, I cannot worship, praise, thank and serve God since I do not know how much I ought to attribute to myself 
and how much to God. But when you read the Bible, you find that salvation is God's work from beginning to end. And because of that, you praise him. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Salvation is his work. And salvation reveals God's righteousness. Verse 2, the Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. The psalmist is putting things in parallel in these first three verses so that you see the connection. And here he's connecting God's righteousness with his salvation. How is his righteousness revealed? In a couple ways. For one thing, we see God's righteous character. He can't just sweep sin under the rug and pretend it never happened. God is just. He must punish sin. He is righteous. And in Christ, God was both just and merciful. He did not leave sin unpunished. But at the same time, he forgave us. Jesus took the punishment of our sin in our place as our representative. And because of that, God could be fully righteous, just, when he forgave our sins. Just and merciful at the same time. This is what the scriptures talk about in Romans chapter 3. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as a sacrifice for sin, propitiation by his blood, to be received by faith. And listen to this. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine patience he had passed over former sins. He didn't forget the sins. He didn't sweep them under the rug. The punishment was paid and he was able to forgive. At the cross God revealed his righteous character. God's righteousness also restored order to the world. God reveals his righteousness through his salvation because God is also making all things right. The world was ruined by sin. God wasn't satisfied to let the world limp along. He is restoring all creation through Jesus Christ, his king. And we'll talk about more of that, more about that in a minute. Salvation reveals God's righteousness. And this is a loud psalm. Our songs are loud because salvation is also a promise fulfilled. God keeps his word. Verse 3, he's remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. Think of all the promises God made to Israel. Starting with Abraham. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. God promised that he would be their God. They would be his people. The land would be theirs forever. He would never forget his faithfulness. Psalm 98 was given to the people in this book while they were in exile. And so the question naturally is, will God really follow through? Yes, he will. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness. He did that through Christ. And notice that salvation, the salvation we sing about is for the world. The end of verse 3. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Now think about if you're an Israelite at this point, a Jew, you're in Babylon, you're in exile, your home's been destroyed, you're living in a foreign land, you don't get to vote for your leaders, you're under the king of Babylon. Is that really going to happen? 
What I really want most of all is for Babylon to be destroyed and let us go back home. But God is thinking of something greater, a salvation that all the world would see and that would make all the world sing. God's plan was bigger than just blessing Israel and rescuing them from exile. His plan was to bless the world. And that was a message Israel needed to hear. It was no time to circle the wagons. Psalm 96, we saw the same thing. What should they do in exile? Psalm 96, 3. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all peoples. Well, this psalm pushes us outward too and keeps us from being focused on ourselves. It puts our heart, pushes our hearts outward in world evangelism. We want the ends of the earth to see the salvation of our God. This is God's heart for the world. Our hearts are the same. Some of us go as missionaries. Some of us send. But all of us have the same heart. We have God's heart for the world if we belong to him. Because God is revealing to the ends of the earth his salvation. And his agenda is our agenda. It's our agenda here at home, too. As people come out of this pandemic, they need hope. The people around us are thirsty for friendship, for relationships, for community. And God's heart for the world moves us out to them, too. That's why we are here to extend the love of Jesus Christ to all people. So what should we do about this? We read here that all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. We see God's heart. What should we do? Well, invite a friend to church. Have him come with you on Sunday morning. They might feel awkward. I haven't been to church for a long time. Have him come sit with you. When you're here, welcome the people that are sitting next to you. You don't know who they are necessarily or what's going on in their lives. They may be here visiting and you need, they need to hear the love of Christ from you. And your smile can do that. If you're in a community group, keep reaching out. Keep an open place on the couch for newcomers and invite them. What better way than to welcome people into the relationships of your community group? You see, God's heart for the world, the one that makes us sing this song with such energy and joy, leads our heart outwards. The call to worship, the summons to worship. And when we see the greatness of God's salvation, that it's his work, his promise kept, his righteousness revealed to the world, then we're ready to understand the sound of worship. Verse 4, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the Lord, before the King, the Lord. Notice the book ends here. Verse 4 starts, make a joyful noise. The second half of verse 6, make a joyful noise. That's what we're supposed to see in the sound of worship, a joyful noise. Now this word joyful noise sounds so proper. That's church language. But really this is shout, cheer. That's what he's saying. So the sound of worship here is enthusiastic. There's energy to it. It's something that erupts, it breaks out spontaneously. You just respond, you see the greatness of God and you go, wow, and you want to praise him. When I think of that, my, uh, (laughs) probably one of the biggest examples I can think of this was when I took my kids to see the Jenks Union football game in 2013. Now you have no idea what I'm talking about. Let me tell you about this. When we moved to Oklahoma, we found that football is a big deal there. The high schools have 10,000-seat stadiums. 
and they're packed. I mean, you can't believe it. Well, Jenks Union was a historic, is a historical rivalry. One of these two teams had won the state championship every year since 1996. The backyard bowl between them is so big that they can't host it at their campus. It's at the University of Tulsa, televised from Chapman Stadium. Our kids were in the Jenks district, and so we were there cheering on the Trojans. And the two teams were locked in a struggle through the whole game. And halfway through the fourth quarter, it was 13-13. With four minutes left, Union kicked a field goal. And the bad guys erupted in cheering. And we were despondent. We were devastated. We're down 16-3. With a minute left... Jenks had the ball on their 19-yard line. First down, passed into the flats, incomplete. Second down, short five-yard pass. Okay, we're up to the 24, that's good. Third down, quarterback drops back across the middle. The receiver picks it up and runs 76 yards for a touchdown with a minute left in the game. And I gotta tell you, our sidelines just erupted. And Jenks won 2013. I actually pulled up the YouTube video of it and our family kind of gathered around yesterday afternoon as I was looking at it and we relived the whole thing again. It was amazing. When you read those words, make a joyful noise, shout or cheer, that's the sort of energy and eruption of shouting you should be thinking of. Now that doesn't mean that our worship is all about emotionalism and we're trying to manipulate, but a genuine enthusiasm that comes from the gospel. We see what God has done for us in Christ and it is so wonderful that we just respond. We lift up Jesus, and when we do, our hearts should jump for joy. When we were working on our vision, we came across this quote from Jonathan Edwards that captures this idea of of grabbing our affections, the motivating center of our heart. He says this, Worship has not occurred when the external duties are performed of reading, praying, singing, hearing sermons, and the like, even when zealously engaged in. But only, worship has only occurred when our hearts are effective and are affected and our love captivated by the free grace of God. And when the great spiritual, mysterious, and invisible things of the gospel have the weight and power of real things in our hearts. And when they do, we want to sing about it. Our worship is, the sound of worship is not just enthusiastic, it's also vocal. We're commanded to sing. That means the human voice. And not just sing, it says sing praise, which refers to the content that we're singing about God and how great he is. That's worth noting because there can be a tendency to turn inward, to be man-centered. It's about me, what I experience, and the blessings that I receive. But no, this is all focused on God. When we're worshiping, we might talk about our experience, but we want the camera to move past us to him so that whatever blessings I've experienced are ultimately focused on him and his greatness and his praise. The camera should never stay on me. It's not just vocal and full of content, but it's also musical. Notice he gives several examples of musical instruments, the lyre, which is a small handheld harp, you know, like that. The trumpet, the horn, 
These are representative of all the range of instruments. This tells us that instruments are worth the investment of fashioning and purchasing them, the time and effort to learn them, the practice to learn songs, to lead singing. When we gather together, God is pleased with this. And he also mentions the sound of melody. This implies composing music, songwriting, music that fits the content, not always necessarily loud and upbeat. There's a time for quiet, there's a time for high energy. Sometimes sad, quiet, introspective, but joyful noise will have a joyful melody. And someone had to compose it. The sound of worship. And this takes us to the scope of worship. There's more going on than we may realize. There's a bigger picture as we worship and praise God for his salvation because our worship is part of the great story of this world, the larger drama that's unfolding before our eyes. The psalmist calls for all creation to praise God as we rejoice in our salvation. Verse seven, let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it, let the rivers clap their hands and the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. Beautiful imagery. You ever stood at the ocean and heard the sea roar? Creation doing its thing the way it's supposed to praises God. Why does creation, the seas and river and hills, praise God for our salvation? Why? Why should the world join us when we're praising God for what he's done for us in Christ? The world was created good, but it was ruined by our sin. When you and I sinned, our disobedience and rebellion disrupted and disordered the entire created world. And as a result, the world is now under a curse, under bondage to decay. It's not working the way it's supposed to. It's like an engine that's not firing on all cylinders, like a wheel that's not quite round like a recipe that's just not quite right. But the salvation of humanity means restoration for the world. God created us as the preeminent apex of his creation, his agents, his image bearers, his representatives in this world. And when we sinned, the entire world was thrown out of whack. And when we're restored, the entire world is made right. This is what the scriptures say in Romans chapter 8. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and attain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning in the pains of childbirth until now. This is God's world. And when God restores humanity, the entire creation is restored. I like the way an Old Testament scholar, Ellen Davis, described this. Here's what she says. Thus the world is revealed for what it really is. In fact, not nature at all, but creation. Still exquisitely sensitive to the presence and will of its maker. Eager to the point of impatience for the full manifestation of God's will in human life. Which is the final goal of judgment. Creation is exquisitely sensitive to the will of God. This brings us to this idea of God's judgment as the culmination of this joy. 
For he comes, it says in verse 9, to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the people with equity. And this might strike your ear as strange. How is judgment the height of joy? This is the great crescendo that this psalm has been leading to. Judgment? Seems strange to rejoice at God's judgment. When we think of our legal system, courts pass sentence and punish those who break the law. We might respect that judgment, but not necessarily rejoice at it. And one of the laws of our society is don't judge. So culturally, this strikes our ears funny. One of the worst things you can do is say that someone is wrong. and judge, Now you're judging what they feel or what they think. That's an unforgivable sin and you will be canceled. So it's hard to see why should we should rejoice that God comes to judge the world. We need to change our thinking here. In fact, God's judgment is a very good thing. It is great news because the point of God's judgment is to restore the world to its intended goodness and perfection. We are, in fact, broken, rebellious sinners. The virus of sin has corrupted our hearts. We love the very things that destroy us. We disorder the world. We damage those around us. And God must correct that if he's going to make this world good. God knows what makes for human thriving and happiness. And he judges this sin that ruins our lives, ruins the world, separates us from him, separates us from each other. His goal is to restore us and to restore this world and to make us whole. And so like a doctor diagnosing and removing disease, God condemns and removes sin to bring life. So his judgment is truly healing and life-affirming and restoring. If you don't like God's judgment then you don't like hearing bad news from the doctor either and you get angry at the doctor. But the doctor is there to correct it. And that's what God's doing. And if you don't like God's judgment, then you must be okay with sin. You must not see what sin has done to the world, to the people you love, to you. And it must not seem serious to dishonor and to disobey this great and glorious God to slap him in the face and fight against him. Not a big deal. But in fact, we will worship God forever for his judgment on this sinful world. One of the most striking places we see this is at the end of the Bible. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. You can see this for yourself. Revelation 19. And notice what is written here. The apostle John has a vision of heaven in this entire book. And here's what he says in verse 19. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice, loud voice again, of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he's judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth of their immorality and avenged on her the blood of his servants. And get this. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. When you and I are in heaven, we will see sin for what it is. We will see sin for what it's done to us. We'll see sin for what is done to this world and to the people we love. We'll see sin for the offense it is against God himself. 
and we will worship God for his judgment. God is removing all evil from this world to restore and renew all creation, a new heaven, a new earth. The saints in heaven see just how good God's judgment is and they pray to him with a loud voice. And that's the crescendo of Psalm 98. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. There's a time to be loud and a time to be quiet. I learned that the morning is not the time for me to sing in the shower. Some psalms are quiet. They deal with sin, defeat, despair, or loneliness. But Psalm 98 is a loud song, a shout, a celebration. It's the song of someone who's experienced God's salvation. Someone who has tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Is it your song? I pray that it is. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful shout of praise. This energetic, enthusiastic psalm that points us to your salvation. And we pray that you would give our hearts the energy and enthusiasm to praise you the way we should because we see Jesus clearly. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. seated we really quickly want to recognize uh, our graduates and so if you'll look in your uh, bulletin you'll see that we have a list of graduates here and uh, this is a huge life event so we want to invite them up and so if you can just come up and stand here with me uh, Samuel Connor and Jesse Cousins and Julia Johnston I think I know her uh, Naki Ignatius Miller William Moore Monson, Rihanna Ramsey, Hannah Stow, and Cameron White. Come on down here. Congratulations. (laughs) 
Why don't you come on over this side here? Thank you. So I've, I've got a book. I'll give this to you afterwards uh, for each of you from high school and, and, and college graduating. Congratulations. This is a huge moment in your lives. And as I was thinking about you guys, I was thinking about uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he has prepared in advance for us to do. And that means that as you're graduating now and stepping off into this next new chapter of life, whether it's more school or working, God has gone before you and he has prepared and planned the good works he has for you to do. And so that means that you can walk forward with confidence and with joy and excitement into the life, the good future God has for you. So let's stand together and pray and commit these graduates to the Lord. Lord, we thank you so much for the good things that you have done in each one of these graduates' lives. And we celebrate the accomplishment of finishing this season of schooling. And we pray for them as they walk forward into the good future that you have ahead for each one of them. We pray that you would give them strength for the challenges, wisdom for the decisions, patience for the frustrations, and love, the love of Christ for everyone they meet. And we pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen, and go with God.